Welcome to the video key for quiz eight. So in the first three questions, we've got these structures and questions about solubility. So really, we know this is a question about IMFs. So we want to match the IMFs of the molecule that we're trying to dissolve in the solvent with the solvent. So water, we know that we can have, um, because it's it's got uh, hydroxyl groups on it, we know we've got H bonding. We know we've got London dispersion. We know we've got dipole-dipole. And we know that we have dipole-induced dipole. And so the full list. So if we look at this other molecule, we can see it's got a functionality similar to water. We've got lone pairs on that oxygen. So it's got the full list too. All IMFs same as water. Obviously not dipole induced because there's no, not uh, ion induced because there's no ions around. Okay, so it's got the same four IMFs as, as water has. Um, and so for that reason, B is going to be most soluble because it's able to hydrogen bond with water. If we look at the molecule that's least polar, that's gonna be molecule C. If we look at molecule C, it's just a hydrocarbon, so the uh, the dipole moment's gonna be very close to zero. And so it has linden dispersion with itself. And with water, it could do linden dispersion and dipole induced dipole, but it's still, we're not matching the IMS very well. So this would be the least soluble. All right, what IMS would be present between B and D? So we're looking at this molecule and this molecule together. And if we look at that molecule, we have an H bond uh, acceptor right here. So if you have an oxygen, fluorine, or nitrogen with lone pairs on it, that is an H bond acceptor. And we've got an H bond donor in the form of that hydrogen atom because it's a hydrogen directly attached to an oxygen, fluorine, or nitrogen. So for that reason, uh, we could form a hydrogen bond between those two molecules. So we have definitely have hydrogen bonding. The first molecule has a dipole moment and the other one does not. So we have dipole induced dipole. Um, because the second one does not have a dipole moment, this, this uh, hydrocarbon molecule, molecule C, we can't do dipole dipole. There's no ions around, let's get rid of that. We always have London dispersion, so those three would be present between those two molecules. What's the sign of delta H for this process? So here we have a process, notice we're forming ionic bonds. So we'll write that, forming ionic bonds. And we're not breaking any bonds. So we'll just say breaking no bonds. So it costs energy to break bonds, but we're, we're not breaking any bonds. And so we don't have to worry about this, but we're forming bonds. Forming bonds releases energy. So we know that this is gonna be an exothermic reaction. Suppose you mix uh, water at 100 degrees C with water vapor at 50 degrees C, 150 degrees C. What parameters do we need to find the mass of vapor at equilibrium? So doing this, we should start by drawing our temperature a heat plot. So we've got gas, we've got liquid, we've got solid, and we know that, that means that this is TM and this is TB. And so now we look and see where we started. Well, the water, we have liquid water, but it's at the boiling point already, so that's this point. We have water vapor, but it's above the boiling point, that's this point. So we're gonna have two processes because the temperature is different so we are going to have, uh, because the temperature is different, we're gonna have a heat transfer. So notice in this first one, we're not changing the temperature. The heat would be the number of moles of water that condenses times the heat of vaporization. That's how much heat we're gonna put in, uh, however many moles condenses, or, or the, sorry, that vaporizes. And over here, we're changing temperature. So we're gonna have an MCAT term, but notice it's the mass of vapor 
times the specific heat of the vapor times delta T for the vapor. So we're gonna need to look up the specific heat of water vapor, and we're gonna need to look up the heat of vaporization. Those are the only two parameters we would need. Salt's quite soluble in water. What's the value of its KSP? So uh, if we're just gonna use an example of sodium chloride, the KSP is the equilibrium constant for that salt dissolving. So that would be the concentration of sodium at equilibrium times the concentration of chloride at equilibrium. And for soluble salts, these are high concentrations. And so the KSP is gonna be a big number. So we'll put more than one here. If you have a salt that's insoluble, at equilibrium, these numbers can be tiny. They can be micromolar or millimolar. So you're gonna end up with a KSP that's less than one. All right, we've got two acids. And both of these acids were making solutions uh, in, 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 uh, in water. And we're given that the solution of the methyl arnoic acid is stronger. But does that mean that there's more hydrogen ion that is formed? So really what this question is asking is, uh, are these weak acids or strong acids? So we know strong acids, strong acids like hydrochloric acid, as soon as you put them into water, they break up completely into hydrogen ion and the anion. So strong acids would be, I'll make a list of strong acids would be, um, we've got hydrochloric acid, hydrobromic acid, hydroiodic acid, nitric acid, and sulfuric acid. And uh, there, oh, I forgot one more, perchloric acid. So these are the ones that are on the uh, list of required uh, acid, strong acids that you were meant to memorize in 124. By process of elimination, just assume all the other acids you'll see this year are going to be weak. And weak acids are different. They're going to have an equilibrium between the ionized form and the form that isn't ionized. And so to find out the concentration of hydrogen ion, we need an equilibrium constant. We need a Ka, and we don't have that. So it could be that the methyl arnoic acid is much more, um, it's a little bit more concentrated, the acid is, but if it has a much smaller Ka, it's gonna yield less hydrogen ion. So the answer is more data is needed. Which species is the best oxidizing agent? For this question, we're gonna to need to look at our list of reduction potentials. The equation sheet gives us uh, standard potentials and that tells us which things are more easily reduced and which things are, are not. So if something is easily reduced, it's gonna have a positive potential. And uh, if it's easily reduced, it's good at oxidizing other things. So we were looking for a strong oxidizing agent. So you don't have to memorize this if you remember two things. If you remember either that chlorine is a good oxidizing agent or that oxygen is a good oxidizing agent, then you'll be able to remember that this whole sector over here, that these reactants are good oxidizing agents. And being a good oxidizing agent doesn't mean that you're good at getting oxidized. It means you're good at getting reduced, right? It's a positive potential. It's a, it's a favorable equilibrium for those things to get reduced. So when they're oxidizing agents, that means they're oxidizing something else. So chlorine can oxidize some other chemical and in the process, it itself gets reduced. So um, one thing that helps is just, ox it's right there in the name, oxygen. So oxygen is an oxidizing agent, okay? so. Look at this quarter of the table. Now, on the other hand, if we have a molecule over here, or a molecule or a species, I'll circle these, 
if we look at the reactants like say a sodium ion it's not good at getting reduced it's actually it's hard to reduce sodium but conversely it's easy to oxidize sodium well if it's easy to oxidize sodium metal or calcium metal that means it's a good reducing agent because if it gets oxidized it's going to reduce something else so we'll put a little arrow here these are good reducing agents So you can see there's sort of like mirror images. Okay, so make sure you understand that an oxidizing agent is, re is a reactant in a reaction, and if it is going to be a good oxidizing agent, it has to itself get reduced, and that would be this quadrant up here. And if it's a good reducing agent, it is something that's gonna get oxidized. So while this reaction as drawn, this forward reaction over here is not favorable, the reverse reaction where a sodium or a calcium or a barium gets oxidized, that would be favorable. So if it gets oxidized, it's a good reducing agent. Okay, so let's go back to our question. Our question was uh, calcium, or rather uh, cobalt and copper, and cobalt and copper ions. So if we look at this, cobalt is up here, and copper is over here. So now we can see that if we want to oxidize something, copper, or actually I didn't have that available, not this one, it was copper two. That was what was in the question. So, um, so copper two is closer to being in this good oxidizing uh, agent section. So you can oxidize things with copper, copper will get reduced, and it will oxidize something else. Okay, so it's better than cobalt, which has a, a less positive reduction potential. So the answer is copper two. All right, so copper two is our better reduction, or better uh, oxidizing agent. It's better at getting reduced itself. Okay, a reaction has a delta G standard that is positive. What does that mean? So we know we can link delta G standard to E standard. So uh, this is not a very good reaction. Delta G standard is positive, so K is gonna be less than one, but also it's gonna have a standard potential that is less than zero. So at equilibrium, we have a lot of reactants, not products, and the standard potential of the cell would be, would be, uh, would be negative. All right, we want to protect chromium from corroding what's left in the rain. Which metals could be attached to the chromium to protect it? So we want something, we need a sacrificial anode. So we want something that it itself will corrode and it will protect the chromium. So we're trying to protect the chromium from corroding. So we don't care about the other metal. In fact, we want it to corrode. We want to keep the chromium from corroding. So we need something. We need an easily oxidized metal. So specifically, we need a metal that's easier to oxidize than chromium. So you might remember that zinc, aluminum, and magnesium are relatively easy to oxidize, but let's go back to our table of potentials to verify that they're easier to oxidize than chromium. So here's our target metal that we're trying to protect, chromium. And if we look, the choices were zinc and aluminum and magnesium. So notice all of those metals have a more negative reduction potential than chromium. Okay, zinc a little bit, but the other one's quite a bit. All of these will be enough that if we had put a wire between the zinc and the chromium or the aluminum and the chromium, it's gonna be the more active metal that corrodes and the chromium will not corrode. This is sort of similar to hooking up the zinc or magnesium to your iron nail in the corrosion experiment.
copper and silver wouldn't work because they're harder to oxidize than chromium. So if we hook them up to the chromium, it would be the chromium that would corrode and not the copper or silver. A reaction has delta G that's positive. So this is a, a mirror image of that other question. Delta G for a reaction is equal to negative NFE. And delta G standard is equal to negative NF. E standard. So just as there's a linkage between Gibbs standard and potential standard, there's also a relationship between Gibbs non-standard and potential non-standard. So if delta G is positive, that means that E is going to be negative. And of course, delta G is positive. That's not a spontaneous process. So we can circle that. Suppose we mix a known mass of liquid at its boiling point with a known mass of vapor at the boiling point. So in both cases, we're talking about heptane. So this is sort of like setting up that, that graph we just talked about. But here, the liquid's at the boiling point, the vapor's at the boiling point, and the key thing is that they're at the same temperature. If they're at the same temperature, we can't have any heat transfer. So they're already at equilibrium, nothing's going to happen. We don't need to look anything up. Okay, but now we have a boiling point elevation problem. So you know if we put things into um, a solvent, we can raise the boiling point. We need the molality of the solute, we need the Van Hoff factor, and we need the uh, boiling point constant for that solvent. So um, they're all going to use one point uh, sorry, no, that's the wrong one. They're going to use 0 0.512 uh, degrees C per molal. That's the boiling point constant for water. So that's the same for all of them because they're all aqueous solutions. Um, and the molality is all the same. So that's all 0 0.1. So the only difference is the Van Hoff constant. If we look at the Van Hoff constant for these different substances, we have a molecule that doesn't break into pieces. Um, a salt that breaks up into three pieces, two potassiums and one sulfate, and a, a salt that breaks up into two pieces, potassium and iodide. So that means that this would be the right answer because it forms more, uh, it has a Van Hoff factor that's bigger than the others. Okay, so for this next question, these are the Chatelier principal questions because we're looking at an equilibrium and then we're perturbing it. So we stir in sodium chloride. So we start off right away by just writing what Q is. So Q is going to be the concentration of hydroxide ion times the concentration of sodium ion uh, all over, well, if we look at the reactants, the solids. So we don't even have to write it. We could write it if we want. It has an activity of one. So if we can affect either one of those concentrations, then we're going to affect this. Well, by putting in sodium chloride, we're adding in, we're, you know, we're increasing this, this concentration, and so that's going to make Q temporarily too big, and we know what's going to happen. If we have K equilibrium, and K is smaller than Q, the reaction is going to go to the left. We're going to, we're going to precipitate out some sodium hydroxide. And so the mass of sodium hydroxide, of solid sodium hydroxide, is going to increase. If we start off at equilibrium and we add more water, both concentrations are going to go down. Well, if both concentrations go down, that's going to make Q smaller. So K equilibrium is going to be greater than Q, and the reaction is going to react to the right. We're going to get rid of reactants and make products. So the mass of solid sodium hydroxide is going to decrease. And the last one, we raise the temperature. Now here we're not changing Q, we're changing K. So remember that um, the log of K is equal to minus delta H over R times one over T plus delta S over R. And so here we, we said that delta H is negative. So if we did a plot of the log of K equilibrium versus one over T, since delta H is negative, 
a negative delta H over R is going to be a positive number. So we're going to have a positive slope. And that means if we look at the high temperature region, since this is a reciprocal plot, the high temperature region, because we talked about um, raising the temperature, right? So we're going to go this way, since it's a reciprocal plot that's raising temperature. So moving that way along the curve is moving down. Your K is going to get smaller. So now your K is temporarily smaller. So if your K is smaller than Q, you're going to react to the left. You're going to precipitate out some solids. So the amount of solid is going to increase. All right, we're using electrolysis to generate a compound. What parameters must we know to calculate the mass that we generate? So if we think about these problems, we start off with, uh, we can start off with uh, the current. We know if we take current times time, that is going to give us charge. And if we do charge, we can use Faraday's constant to get the moles of electrons. Then we have to look at the moles of uh, stuff that we're trying to make that's not electrons, right? So for that, we do need the number of electrons transferred. And then moles of stuff, we can convert to mass of stuff if we have the, um, if we have the molar mass. So look, look what we need here. We certainly need time. And we certainly need current, and we need the numbers of electron transferred. Now, if we wanted to calculate mass, we'd also need molar mass that's, that's not given here, so we can't circle it. If it were, we, we'd have to circle it. But notice temperature and voltage are irrelevant. We need those for voltage problems, but not for these kind of stoichiometry problems. So we want a metal that is most prone to corrosion, so it's easiest to oxidize. So we can rephrase this as easy to oxidize. And another way of saying that is that we want to have, uh, well, we don't want to have a reduction potential that's very positive, right? If we had a reduction potential that's very positive, that would mean it would be easy to reduce it. So we want to look at a reaction with a negative reduction potential. Okay, so we're going to go and look at our tables of potentials. So we've got chromium, copper, iron, nickel, and silver. If we go to the equation sheet, you can see, I guess I'll use triangles this time. We're looking for a number that's down here. We don't see any of those metals here until we get here. So we had chromium um, was one of the ones we were looking at. We were looking at uh, nickel, we had silver, and we know silver is way over on this other side, so that's going to be not as easy to, to, uh, to oxidize. We had iron, so the one that was most easy to oxidize that was on that list was chromium. So we can see chromium was our, our best choice because it was the easiest to oxidize of all the metals on that list. Okay, it was lower down, it had a more, more negative reduction potential. All right, we build a voltaic cell using reaction below. We run this cell for a long period of time, what happens to the voltage? So remember that voltage is given by the standard voltage minus RT over NF log of Q. So what, ha what matters is what happens to Q as a function of time. So we write our expression for Q, it would be concentration of mag magnesium ions over the concentration of oxygen to the one half over the concentration of hydrogen ion squared. Okay. So as time passes, what's happening? We're using the reaction, and so we're taking the reactants and we're turning them into products. So that means the concentration of magnesium ions is going to go up. The concentration of these other ions is going to go down, So or other chemicals. So that means over time, if we look at Q as a function of time, it's going to get larger. 
okay, if we have anything that is a um, something in solution. So, so this doesn't matter for pure solids and liquids, but it does matter for all the solutes. So if Q is getting bigger, that's going to make the log of Q bigger, and that means we're going to be eating away at E. So E is going to get smaller because we've got this negative term here. So it goes down. Suppose that the standard cell potential for a reaction is 0.4 volts. What happens if we double the reaction? So delta G is, and we're looking at standard potentials here, so delta G standard is negative NF E standard. Or we can say E standard is equal to delta G standard over negative NF. Okay, so what this means is if we double the reaction, delta G standard will double. The number of joules are going to double, but the number of electrons transferred will also double. So if we, in the original reaction, it was a one electron transfer. If we double the reaction, it's a two electron transfer. So the joules would double, but the number of electrons would double too. So there's no change. So we don't change voltages when we double a reaction or cut it in our half or whatever. It's always the standard cell potential is whatever it is. We don't, we don't change it. We want to calculate the standard cell potential of a cell. What parameters do we need? So E standard is equal to E cathode minus E anode. So if we have those two things, we are ready to go. That's all we need. Okay, we're supposed to annotate this diagram. I'm going to shrink this down a little bit so we can put it all on one screen. Okay, and then we'll answer the questions. So um, we'll annotate it first and then, and then that will help us to answer the questions. So this is one we built in class and uh, the skills are the same as all the other cells we've done. So we look at this and we're given the reaction, we're given that aluminum is oxidized to aluminum three. So the aluminum at the bottom of this cell is losing electrons, okay? And electrons don't travel through the water in the paper towel, they travel through the wire. So if we think about this half cell, we've got aluminum going to aluminum three plus plus three electrons. And those electrons are gonna go up through this wire. Um, we're going to be, since the, the ions are, um, uh, as the ions diffuse into that paper towel, they're leaving behind their electrons. And so that's gonna make this have a negative charge because we're dumping electrons on it. Let's look at the other side. On the other side, we can see of oxygen being, uh, being reduced to water. So we're going from oxygen that has oxidation state of zero to oxygen that has an oxidation state of minus two. So we're going to need electrons for that. And we can actually, if we wanted to, we could break this down into a half reaction. We could write the whole thing. We can say we have three oxygens. We have 12 H plus, um, and we've got six. So if we wanted to balance this, we don't, we don't have to for this problem. Let's just go ahead and do it. Uh, we're neutral on the right, so we need to uh, make it neutral on the left. We could put 12 electrons over here. So we've got six oxygen atoms, and so if we add 12 electrons to the six oxygen atoms, each one's going to go to a minus two oxidation state, which we need. Okay, so we clearly need electrons for the other electrodes. So those electrons are going to flow through the light, through the wire, and there they can meet up with the oxygen. So what's the oxygen doing? The oxygen's coming down, it's absorbing onto this charcoal, and it's meeting up with the uh, so hydrogen ions from the water, and it's meeting up with uh, electrons from the wire, and it's gonna produce more water. So this water is gonna be produced inside that charcoal, the charcoal uh, salt bridge interface. And since the since the negative charge is in this, in this sort of uh, anti-clockwise cycle in terms of electrons, we know we have to complete that cycle with some other negative ion in the salt bridge. And so we know that's going to be, uh, we said that we soaked the paper towel 
in salt water. So there's sodium ions, or actually, sorry, negative ions, chloride ions going this way. So chloride ions are going that way, sodium ions are the countercurrent going that way. All right, so that's inside the paper towel. Um, so I think we have finished annotating this. We could go ahead and call this the anode, and we could call this the cathode. So the cathode is the conductive object where their chemistry is taking place, and that's going to be our, our charcoal. The anode is going to be on the surface of the foil, and the salt bridge is the paper towel. Okay, what kind of cell is this? Well, remember that we said we're using this to power a light, uh, an LED, right? a tiny little light bulb. So if we're powering something with it, this is not something that requires energy, it's something that produces energy. So it is a uh, voltaic cell. What is the value of E for this? Well, the answer is right there. If it is a voltaic cell, it must be that E is a positive number. Okay, we're using it, we can't light a light bulb with a negative voltage. We've got to, if, it's, if this reaction is spontaneous in the forward direction, it's gonna have a, an E that is positive. We could also, um, uh, let's go on to the next one. So, which way, which way do the electrons travel? So, the question is, do the electrons go through the wire or do they go through the salt bridge? We know electrons are gonna go through a conductive object like a wire, but which direction? We already showed that it's going anti-clockwise. So, uh, we've got that as going from right side to the left-hand side, but through the wire. What's the cathode? We already said the cathode is the charcoal because that's where the reduction, potential, reduction reaction takes place. And the sodium ions, uh, the sodium ions are going to go, uh, as we showed in this uh, diagram here, they're going to go uh, in the sort of uh, clockwise direction, um, which means they're going to go from bottom to top inside the paper towel. They're going from the anode to the cathode through the paper towel and uh, on the cathode, you can see you're consuming a cation, and you need to somehow replace that in the solution, and you can do that with the sodium ions. So the answer is from bottom to top inside the paper towel, right? So inside this paper towel, we've got sodium ions going from one side to the other. And what's the charge in the foil? We already said that charge is negative because uh, the anode reaction is dumping electrons onto the foil and that's going to build up and they're going to be repelled and that's why they flow through the wire away from the anode. Okay, on the next one, I did make this next one a bonus question because I decided it was just too hard to estimate accurately. We can do it, but uh, it's, it's, so I made it a bonus. But anyway, let's go ahead and say how we could do this accurately. We're trying to find the rate here. And we don't want to, we want to find, we want to draw a tangent basically to that. And the easiest way to do that is just to pick two adjacent points on the graph. So um, we're gonna pick this point and this point and draw a line through there. We can see that's pretty close to being a tangent through the, that one point. Okay, so if we do that, we're going to get uh, the slope is rise over run. So we have roughly 0.65 minus one. And for the, for the run, we have five seconds minus zero seconds. And the first one was molarity. So the slope is going to be zero point three five molarity over five seconds and if we wanted to we could rewrite that as 0 0.70 molarity divided by 10 seconds is multiplied top and bottom by by two and so we can see that's going to be 0 0.07 molarity per second or we could say that's 0 0.07 moles Per liter per second. It's probably a better way of writing that. Okay, so doing that gets us to um, our rate, and we can see that's here.
a reaction is exothermic, what's the value of delta S for this reaction? And you may remember that delta S and delta H for a reaction, those are, those are independent variables. So we, we can't get one from the other. Uh, you might be fooled by thinking about this equation, but this equation is only applicable for phase transition. So if you have a transition like uh, boiling or melting, you can use the heat of the transition to get the delta S a transition, but you cannot do this for chemical reactions, so we need more data. There's reactions that are exothermic that have a negative delta S reaction and some that have a positive delta S reaction. There's just not a relationship there. A system undergoes a spontaneous process. What can be included about the entropy of the system, the change in entropy of the system? So if spontaneous, we know delta S for the universe is going to be positive, but not necessarily for the system. And so we, we just don't know. There's more data needed. What metal is most easily oxidized? And this is another one of going back to, it's sort of the same question. It's, it's the same as asking which one's most easily corroded or which, which one corrodes most easily. There's really all the same questions. Calcium is really low on that list. Uh, it has a negative reduction potential. So let's just go in and take a look at where calcium is on the equation sheet. And we can see calcium is, is way down here. So, Calcium ion has a very negative reduction potential. It's hard to reduce calcium ion, which means it's easy to oxidize calcium. So it's most easily oxidized. All the other metals were way up on this list um, above calcium. And the final question, we wish to calculate the potential of a cell. Which parameters do we need? So here, we know that we can calculate the potential using the Nernst equation. So notice, we need the temperature, we need the standard cell potential, and we need Q, and we need the number of electrons transferred. So let's circle some of these. We need the temperature, number of electrons transferred. Uh, if we have the concentrations of solutes, that will enable us to get Q. Uh, what about these other two? Well, to get E standard, we know E standard is E standard cathode minus E standard anode. So we, we need those two. So actually we need all five to get the potential of the cell. And that's it for the key for quiz eight. Thank you for watching.